Arian Calza. So who am I in more detail? I am pre-sales engineer at GuardSquare. I tweet a lot. I love breaking applications and I love securing applications. And today my talk will be about some of my experiences in Android application security. So first some words on GuardSquare. So GuardSquare is a company behind ProGuard and DexGuard. Do you guys know ProGuard? Yeah. So um, ProGuard is part of the Android SDK. Um, and uh, it's basically an obfuscation and optimization tool for Android. Our headquarters are based in Leuven, Belgium. And this is a Twitter handle and a website. So um, we got that out of the way now. So the outline of today's talk will be a history of incidents, some application security issues that, were in the pa uh, that happened in the past, the attack services of a mobile application, so how will hackers attack your application, what are, the what are the best practices to secure these applications? And a little recap of what we saw in this presentation today. So let's start with a history of incidents. This is the Android SwiftKey keyboard application. It was a very popular, or is a very popular application. And uh, it uses some artificial intelligence to give you better um, uh, suggestions with your autocorrection or uh, words that you type into your keyboard. And, um, you had a paid and you had a free version, and the paid version was put online um, with a, as a pirated version, so you could use all the paid options for free. But the hacker also introduced a keylogger in the app, so your keyboard application is now a keylogger, and this is typically not something you want to have on your device. The Pokemon Go app, it's a very popular app uh, these days, um, but when it launched, it, it was only available in three countries. So a lot of people wanted to play this, um, but weren't able to download it. So they were, they were resorting to third-party app stores. And hackers put the application on this app store, and they also introduced a Trojan horse in it. And it was massively downloaded, and a lot of devices were compromised. Sensitive information leaks. There was a research a couple of years ago where a lot of application has, applications has been reverse engineered with a static code an analysis. And a lot of these API keys were retrieved from, from applications. But some services give you API keys, and these are free, so you don't have to pay for it. But other services give you an API key, and they are billing you based on how much you use the API key. So if a hacker wants to use a paid service, then he just looks for an API key that he can find from another application, and you're paying the bill in the end. So you might want to secure that a little bit more. And this is a story about an Android uh, a game, a very popular game. It just uh, cost, cost it 99 cents, but the rate of piracy was that high that the developer in the end just said, OK, I'll give it away for free because all this hassle is it's just too much. And that's a, quite a sad story. So today I want to talk about attack services to begin with. So, when we look at an Android application, there are basically three uh, attack services. You have your application, which communicates with the execution environment on, on which it uh, runs. And you have communication to the outside. So these are the three major attack services that hackers try to uh, um, um, exploit. So um, what are the techniques here? Uh, debug analysis, for example, to see how the application runs, um, uh, where you can trace the code. Um, emulator analysis, hooking frameworks, and rooted environments. So with hooking frameworks, I mean um, these, these frameworks like Exposed, uh, for example, or Frida. Um, or rooted environment, because on a rooted device you can do much more. When it comes to your application, typical things that hackers do, they try to reverse engineer it. They try to pirate your application. They try to search for re-cryptography, because this allows them to to um, extract sensitive user information. Or they inject a Trojan, like in the Pokemon Go application. Or just show them uh, a popular login screen from a popular app, for example, Netflix, and allow you to log in. But in the end, they're just sending the credentials over the wire to a server under the attack of the attacker. Ah, OK. Can you make sure it's on? Yeah. Oh, that's oh, my microphone. Did you unplug my yeah, microphone? That's, 
wrong microphone. Yeah, you that's gotta use this microphone. one here. Well, that this one? Why? Yeah, oh, either or. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just, <laughs> this one here. Yeah? Yeah. This? You can just use the handheld. Yeah, the handheld is better. Here, put the microphone on the bottom there. Sorry, Sorry guys. about that. Technical. There we go. Test, test. Check one, two. Okay. Ah, test, test. Okay. Okay. Now we've got the technical issues uh, out of the way. So um, the third part here is the communication, which is an attack surface. And typical attacks here are man in the middle attacks or attacks on um, the usage of weak protocols in SSL, for example. So some tools that attackers use. For static analysis, for example, they will grab your application, they put it on a, on a laptop, on a computer, and they will use these tools to reverse engineer the code. For example, APK tool, really popular tool. They just, it just allows you to decompile it and build it again, the application. And that's Mali Bex Mali, which is um, a disassembler, which means it takes your code, it reverts it to an intermediate bytecode, and the hackers can change little things and then recompile it. Um, ours, which is in uh, the Android reverse engineering switch, suite. It's an open source project I started. It's written in Python, and it does some um, basic um, research, um, automated research um, uh, steps, um, which, are, which are useful when you want to reverse engineer apps to look at how safe they are, for example, for a penetration test. Then we have Bytecode Viewer, which, is, which shows you a lot of decompilers next to each other. Which is, which is cool because some decompilers can decompile a code and then you can switch to the other decompiler and then back to the first decompiler. And then we have some commercial tools like JAP or IDA Pro. So what do they use for network analysis? Man in the middle proxy, for example. Charles, Burp Suite or Wireshark. And they try to put themselves in, en route between the client and between the server tries to communicate with. Some more tools for dynamic, ana dynamic analysis. We have emulators like the Android standard emulator and Genie Motion. Hooking frameworks, Exposed, Cydia, Substrate, and Frida. And these allow to basically, you can say which methods you want to hook in an application, and it allows you to hook in the application and see the ar arguments passed by to the, to the method. And um, see, um, see you can basically trace the whole application. And some standard tools like ptrace, Java Debug Bridge and the uh, new debugger. So now that we have some tools, how can you secure your applications better? I'll show you in this presentation. So it's important to use secure best coding practices. So there are a lot of things you can do wrong with security sensitive code. So I, I'll just give some pointers in this presentation. So you can also protect, uh, protect, obfuscate, and encrypt your application code, which I show you also in this application. Take into the account, take into the, account the execution environment. Is, it, is the app running in a secure environment? How can I check that? How, what should you think of? How should, re, should, should you react on it? And you can harden your communications. So we want to secure applications, but how do we do it? Great question. Glad you asked. So let's start with cryptography. It's a scary word, but let's start with the basics. So we have symmetric crypto, and it uses one key for encryption and decryption. And examples of this are RES, <coughs> triple DES, RC4, and you have many more symmetric algorithms. And the second uh, type is public key crypto, which, is, which uses a private and a public key. And the way you use these keys determines the use case. So for example, if you encrypt with a private key and you decrypt it with a public key, you, get, uh, you, you can verify the digital signature. And, you have, and if you encrypt it with a public key and you decrypt it with a private key, you have confidentiality because only the person holding the private key can decrypt the message. Examples of these are RSA, Diffie <coughs> Hellman, Al Gamal, and some more advanced uh, protocols. So what are the don'ts in an Android application? Hard-coded crypto keys. So we see a lot of people, they want to decrypt or encrypt something. And at some point in their code, they have to define which key they want to use. So instead of generating it on runtime, they just decide to put a, to put a hard-coded cryptography key into the app. That's not something you want to have because it takes an attacker just a little bit of effort to reverse engineer your app once, and then he has a key for all 
your apps running on, on different devices. So every data <coughs> that's encrypted on those devices are encrypted with the same key. There are some people that save crypto keys in SD card. That's also another good option here because the SD card is readable by everyone who has a permission ex a read <coughs> external or read write, read external storage or write external storage. Log sensitive information. It's also something that people forgot to strip out of the application. For example, if you're working on an authentication mechanism and you want to debug it for yourself and you say, okay, uh, step one, um, got the encryption keys. Step two, authentication successful. Step three, enrolling. This is a lot of information for an attacker because now he knows where he has to look in the code, at which point it executes. So you, there's no real use case to have the sensitive information still in your log stream when your application is running in production. Use AES in ECB mode. So this needs some background. <laughs> AES, you can, AES is a form of a block cipher, and you can use it in, in different modes. For example, ECB is electronic cookbook, codebook mode, which basically um, doesn't hide patterns in the code. So if you're encrypted with AES and ECB, you can still find patterns. So you can just, an encrypted image in ECB format just sho still shows you the structure of the image. That's not something you want to have. If you use DES or MD5, then you should know it's broken or weak. MD5 doesn't take much time to crack. Implement do-it-yourself cryptography is probably the worst thing you can do in your application. You're not smarter than crypto analysts or cryptographers. Don't do it. Use the protocols that are designed for encryption. And one that not a lot of people know, but don't use string objects for sensitive information because string objects in Java are by default immutable. So if you make a string object and you put a sensitive key in it or a sensitive password, then you're basically waiting on the garbage collector and you have no control on the string being removed from memory. So what you want to use there is a char array, for example, because you can zero out the array and you have control over the contents of an array. And not fixing the secure random vulnerability in Jelly Bean pre Pre-Jelly Bean, there was an issue with the secure random implementation on Android devices. And online, you can find fixes for it, but a lot of people forget to uh, implement the fix. So let's dive in some code. I will show you now how you can perform a key generation um, algorithm. So the typical thing here, I, I told about not storing hard-coded crypto keys in your application. So you need to generate the symmetric key on the device for user data, for example. And here in this example, we will generate a 256-bit AES key derived from a password. So a user has to enter a password every time you want to encrypt or decrypt his data. And this is an example. So a method get encryption key for a char array with a strong password. And this is the best practice to derive a key from it. As you can see, there's an iteration count. 10,000 is standard for ice cream sand sandwich and above. We have a key length of 256 bits. And we have a salt length. And then we generate, with a secure random, a salt uh, array, which we will uh, give to the um, key um, um, specs. And um, then we have the secret key factory, which generates um, a, a secret key um, based on the um, password-based key derivation function 2, which you can see here, oh, okay. um, with HMAC SHA-1 signing. So what this function will do, it takes your, your password and it will derive a key from it, but it will deliberately do it slow, because if a hacker wants to brute force your key, he has to use the same function, and because this deliberately slows down the generation of a key by a, by a couple of hundred milliseconds, it takes much harder to perform a dictionary or brute force attack. So these are the standards uh, today. So once you have a symmetric key in place, how should you manage your key? And I, I'm ordering these from do's to don'ts. So the first one is how you should do it. You should ask for a password and do not store keys on the device. And you, you should use the password-based key derivation function version 2, which I showed in the previous slide. If you want to store it, the key, because you don't want to ask the password every time your user uses your app. You can store it in the keychain. But you have to know that it's vulnerable on rooted devices. It's not that easy to extract it on a rooted device, but it's still possible to extract it on a rooted device. 
you can generate keys and store it in shared preference, but then you have to know that on a vulnerable and rooted, uh, it's vulnerable on rooted devices because on a rooted device, every other application can uh, ask for root access and they can um, browse to your um, private application directory and just read out your shared preferences. Use hard-coded key in your application code, which is uh, not the baddest way to use keys in crypto, in Android. So the problem here is you have one key. You're reverse engineering it. If your key is leaked, then you have a big problem because you have to update your app. And you store your generated key in the SD card. It's readable by all apps, so it's not best practice. And just stop doing that. It's not good. You should never do it. There's never a good use case for doing that. And in the end, while you're working with cryptography, you should always keep in mind this cartoon of XKCD. And it basically says, OK, we have a really strong uh, public uh, crypto key here. How are we going, uh, public private crypto key, how are we going to crack it? Yeah, it's too strong. Um, our evil plan will not work. And then um, what would actually happen is just the guy going to the, <coughs> the, to the person who holds the key and just um, yeah, ask for the key with some putting, well, by putting some pressure on them. <laughs> so what I want to say with this cartoon is that in the end, the weakest link in your encryption scheme, if you do all the things right, is the users using your app. So we had cryptography, now code protection. First step you can do, you can, name, you can use name obfuscation, or how we like to call it, ProGuarded. And this means that you're going to change the name of your classes, your name of your methods, to something unreadable, human unreadable, something that says nothing to a human. But it's semantically equivalent, so it runs perfectly fine on the device. String encryption, you can dynamically decrypt and load strings. So on runtime, on build time, you can basically encrypt the string and you can put the decryption method in your code. So when you look statically at the code, you won't find the string, but it gets decrypted on runtime and put into memory so you can still use a string in your app while it's running. You can do the same for code. So you can encrypt whole classes because Android allows you to load dynamic classes. You could encrypt these, decrypt them on runtime and load the classes uh, into memory and then start using them. This means when you're doing a static analysis uh, attack that this code is not available uh, in your app. It's only available in memory on runtime. You can do the same for your resources, assets, and native library encryption. The idea here is the same. You encrypt it on build time, you decrypt it on, uh, on uh, runtime, and it puts, uh, you put it in memory. You can add control flow and automatic obfuscation. So what I mean here with control flow is, for example, you add a lot of extra paths to your code. So when a reverse engineer looks at your code, he has to find out what all the paths are doing. But in the end, when the application runs, there is only one good way of executing the method, and um, your application just runs fine. But the code is really blown up while, while you reverse engineer the app. And you can hide calls through reflection, which is one of my favorites. Because when you use reflection, you take away the hard method call. So you don't see uh, a method call to a class, but you see uh, a call to the reflection framework, to the instrumentation framework, and you see a string passed to that framework, which defines which class you want to load and which method you want to invoke. So there's a lot of things that I mentioned here. I'll pick three of them, and I'll show them on an example. So for example, we have this method, encrypt sensitive message, which has a nuclear launch code, and it encrypts it with a secret key, and it returns the encrypted message. So who has paid attention in my presentation? You see I use string objects here. That's my first mistake, but just to keep the, the, the example clear. Um, so API call hiding, how does that change the code? So you see how we load the crypto engine now. It's a class um, that we create class object. We create a method object and we invoke it. So what we have here, it breaks our, our automatic call graph analysis. So for example, when an attacker wants to get insight in your application, it creates a call graph, like methods calling, uh, methods calling other methods and so on. And it shows you how the application is structured. By using reflection, you basically break the connections between 
these calls because statically you can't analyze what this is doing. You have to um, execute it on runtime. String obfuscation or string encryption. And we use base64, which is not encryption, but an encoding. So we went from these strings here in plain text to the, their base64 um, representation, and we decode them on runtime. So now we have call hiding, and we have base64. So we went from the initial piece of code to this code, which does the same thing, but it's already a, a some, somewhat harder to read. You don't have to use base64 because you can just decode it online. There's a lot of decoders around there. So what you want to use here is like your own implementation of base64 or different. Um, so be creative. For example, you can switch out the translation centers for base64 so people won't recognize as base64, but you can still use the algorithm. And you can do name obfuscation, which is a third layer. So this changes the method names, changes the class names. Um, and it makes it something very unreadable. So if you if we go back, which is the first example, uh, which is the first code pe uh, snippet, and after three layers, we got this. So it's the purpose of the code. It's really harder to determine what this is exactly doing. You just see instrumentation going on, and you see some method calls. That's basically everything. And you see a, a string being returned. The purpose of the code, uh, so the sensitive strings are only visible on runtime, as I said before, and your automatic, automatic call graph analysis is broken. So with just three layers, it's already a lot harder for an attacker to reverse engineer this piece of code. Now, it's hard to do this on your own because you cannot maintain this. You, if you do this in your code base, then <laughs> a developer that comes in later, or you, if you look at a couple of months later, then, okay, what the hell did I wrote here? Well, it's effective. so you. That's, that's, that's good, but okay, it's not maintainable. So um, at our company, we develop Dexcart, which does this automatically in your build process. You don't have to take care of it. It's a big brother of ProGuard, so if you use ProGuard, Dexcart works perfectly. Um, it's a great old plugin. Your co configuration keeps working. And for all the other features, I recommend to go to our website. Now, being being securing applications, and, and by looking at applications, I gathered some libraries which I think find, I find interesting to use. For example, secure preferences, if you use a shared preferences um, method in Android, you can use this library, which is by, uh, by Alexander Scott, Scotty Brown, I think. Scott Brown, yeah. It's a wrapper for shared preferences, and it uses AS. 128 uh, in CBC mode, which is a good mode to use, not ECB. And um, it lets you configure it, lets you configure it with a user-supplied password. Um, this is the GitHub, and this is how you use it. So all the encryption and decryption of your string values or all the values, key values that you store are encrypted on runtime and decrypted uh, on the fly back if you use it. And you can still use a shared preference uh, implementation. IO Surfer. Does anybody know this library? It's a really cool library. Cool. Yeah. Well, it basically gives you a virtual encrypted disk, which is an encrypted file storage for your app. So if you use this, then you know that everything you write to this file storage will be encrypted and decrypted on the fly. And it's a clone of the Java.io APIs. So that's also pretty awesome. You can just keep using it. And everything you need to know are three important methods. How you get a virtual file system, it's like with this method. Um, how you mount it, so you mount it with a password. And how you unmount it. So once you have this in place, you can just start using uh, the virtual encrypted disk and write um, stuff to it. And this is the project page. Another cryptography library is Conceal, which is based on, uh, of a, 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 um, developed on top of the OpenSSL library. And it uses AES in Galois counter mode, which is a really strong implementation of AES. It's, it's optimized for a small size and fast performance. It's built and used by the Facebook app, so that's cool. So all your images in the Facebook application are encrypted and decrypted with Conceal. 
So if it works in that application, it will certainly work in your application. This is a project page. Um, it's all open source, so you can look at it. And this is an example how you can use it. So you use a keychain, so you can do you can create a, a keychain which is backed by a shared preference uh, uh, directory. Um, you, you have to see if the cryptography is available here, and then you open a file stream. Uh, you can write to it, and you pass it an, an entity ID, which says which um, which data you're writing uh, to the stream, and then you can write the actual data and close the stream. That's how easy it is to use uh, Conceal, which gives you, by just using this library, it already gives you some added security, um, and you don't have to do the heavy lifting yourself, so the library takes care of that. So now we saw the application code, so, how you, so I showed some security libraries, I showed some code obfuscation tools, um, so how can you secure your communications? So I'll cover some SSL basics here. I don't know if you're all familiar with SSL, but in SSL you have a certificate, which is basically a piece of cryptographically signed identification information. It just, it's, a, it's a sound way of saying, okay, this is me, this is my identity, you can trust me. In SSL, certificates are issued by certificate authorities which are servers that we trust. So that's how the PKI system is built. You trust some predefined number of uh, rooted, uh, root CAs, and every certificate issued by this CA, by default, you trust. So your Android device comes with a list of uh, certificates um, which it trusts, just as your browser and your laptop does. It uses a basic set a data database of certificates. And by default, all these root certificates that you trust, you also trust every certificate that is issued by, this specific, uh, by these specific uh, CAs. And this is what we call the chain of trust. Now the SSL validation is check if certificate of the server is issued by a trusted certificate authority. So th th that's everything you need to know about SSL, if you use SSL or HTTPS in your application. So, how does this protocol work? So your client, your application says to a server, hey, can you identify yourself? This happens all under the hood. Um, and the server says, yeah, sure, I'm google.com, here's my certificate. So now the client has to do some work. It has to check which CA issued the certificate that you received from google.com. And do you trust that CA? So the, the device or the client checks, do I trust the CA? Yes, okay, validation is done. Connection is trusted, and you can start standing. You can start negotiating, negotiating a session key, and you can start encrypting stuff over the wire. If you don't trust it, then you check is the certificate self-signed. Then your validation failed, and you don't trust the connection, and you break everything down, and there's no SSL happening tonight. Is a certificate issued by another CA? So we have this chain of trust. Then you go back to step two, and you check do I trust the CA, and then you go back into the validation algorithm. Now, why am I telling this? Because you need to notice how, how a man-in-the-middle attack works. So an attacker needs to get a trusted certificate on your device, and it has two ways. It can use one of the hacked CAs, so a hacker hacks a CA, a root certificate like DigiNotar and Komodo. These were, or are, I think DigiNotor went out of business. Komodo is still in business. And these are root CAs, which allow customers to buy a certificate. And hackers basically hack this root CA, and they start issuing certificates for themselves. So by default, all the devices that trusted Digitar, DigiNotor and Komodo also trusted these certificates issued by the hacker. So if you can get a hold of that certificate, then you're in business. Or you can just install your own certificate if you have physical access to the device and you can install it in Android and mark it as trusted, which marks it as trusted. And when you have that in place, then all the traffic can be read or altered by the man in the middle. So on Android, you can do some things to protect against it. So as I told before, by default, the Android applications trust all the, the, the certificates in the default store of your device. 
And if you want to change this from application space or from your own application, you have two options. You can do one, you can do pin on public keys, or you can provide your own to a store of certificates. So what this means basically is you don't trust the whole validation anymore. So if a, if a, if a certificate intermediate, a rooted <coughs> CA or an intermediate CA has been hacked, you say, OK, that doesn't my I, I pin on this certificate. And only if this certificate is shown to me, I trust the connection. And the second option, um, so with the public, that you check that with the public key. And in the section, uh, second option, you just give your own trust store of CA. So you say, OK, forget the default ones on the system. Just use these certificates. Now, how can you implement this with an open source library? For example, Moxie has a really good implementation. And you can just define a string array with the public keys of the certificates that you trust, so from your, from your own server backend. You can create an HTTP client, and you can start executing um, stuff uh, on your HTTP um, connection. And uh, all these connections using this um, uh, HTTP client will be pinning on that certificate that you defined here. So this is an example of public key pinning. And this basically means that you don't trust any other certificates on the device, or, or don't trust any other root CA certificates on your device, but only that one of Google that you define in the string array here. Now, it's hard to do this. So there are all libraries that, there's another library that can help you with this, which is NetSurfer. And it, it basically allows you to use best practices in network security. And you don't have to define it yourself. Um, if you're using TLS SSL and you use this library, then it gives you um, the best configuration possible um, um, for um, doing stuff over HTTPS. And as I talked about the default uh, certificate stores, this library uses the Mozilla one and the Debian one, which are open source. So you can, yeah, of course, you can check which certificates are trusted. But also important, these are actively monitored, so they 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 uh, act quite fast. There are a lot of updates if there is one thing uh, wrong with the certificates. And the best part is it has Tor integration. So you can this is being used in the Tor application to access a Tor network, which you can al also use in your own application, which is pretty cool. That's the GitHub project page. Now, if you already use some network libraries, it's OK, because NetSurfer integrates perfectly with it. So if you use the standard HTTP URL connection, or if you use OK HTTP or Volley or Apache, then these are the clauses that matter. So you can use a builder, and um, it basically gives you uh, uh, something that you can work with um, in your application. This is how easy it is to use. So you, for example, for OK HTTP, you want the best configuration. So you say, OK, make me one. And you can use the method for max security, and it will give you the best configuration possible. That's pretty sweet. So now we covered the application, we covered the communication, so it's time for the execution environment, which I was talking about. So what you want to protect against are dynamic application attacks. Because when you protect your code statically by using ProGuard, by using DexGuard, then the attacker will shift his efforts to dynamic attacks because the code is harder to read. He first wants to get an impression of the code, or maybe he wants to dump your code from memory. So the three main attack techniques here are um, dynamic code injection, also known as hooking, which basically says, OK, hook the method encrypt in all the clauses of this application. And then it will uh, give you a trace of when it's used, um, when it's called, and which, which variables are used to call the method, for example. Attaching debuggers, for example, are just plain memory dumping. So on a rooted device, by modifying the kernel on an Android device, you can just dump the memory. And if you're loading your, mem your code in memory, then this is the way that attackers will, uh, this is the, the technique that they will use to basically get to your unencrypted code. So for dynamic code injection, some tools are exposed, Frida or Cydia Substrate, which is somewhat deprecated. But just for completeness, I added them. They all require a rooted device. And the way they work is that they inject code during recompilation or inject code in your process. 
So processor is running on a rooted device. It has this FRIDA agent or this exposed agent running on the device and it injects us during recompilation or it injects the code in the process um, of your application. So by recompilation, I don't know if you know this, but it's on Android devices when you install an application it gets recompiled, it's like this optimization, optimization dialogue that you, uh, that you get, like um, optimizing apps. This is actually your Android device uh, re recompiling uh, your apps um, and optimizing them for your device. So this is an, a perfect point for a, a tool to basically inject its own code. So you can, place this, you can place hooks before, during, or after method calls that you find interesting. So debuggers, um, yeah, these are the standard ones, the Java debug bridge, the new project uh, debugger. Um, so inspect code executions, um, the <coughs> paths in the code or the variables from your code. Um, yeah. <laughs> In Android, if you want to debug an application, it's just enough to basically um, decode your Android manifest, turn debuggable, debuggable on true, and just run, the, run it in a debugger. Um, tools like API, APK tool can do that for you. It gives insight in the code structure. And this is um, typically what you want to have because um, static code might be using a lot of code obfuscation. So using this, you can uh, step through the code and you can basically see the application executing um, and see the changes happening in your code. So memory dumping, which is a more advanced technique, and um, the more advanced security tools, they offer code encryption, like Dexcode, for example, does clause encryption. This means that the code is available in memory, and you have to dump the memory to get to the encrypted code. And this needs kernel support, so you need to have some kernel knowledge. Or you can just use the Linux memory extractor, which lets you compile it for Android targets. Um, so if you want to do some um, pen testing on your own app, which I highly encourage, so you should always pen test your own application before you send it in the wild, um, you might look at Lime for um, dumping stuff in memory. So how can you secure your environment? Well, an application can scan its environment. There are a lot of variables that you can ask. And you, you have to ask yourself, should it run on a rooted device? For example, a banking application. It might run on a rooted device, but is it wise to do a transaction on a rooted device? Because it might be hooked or it might be, um, or it might be a, a tampered application um, where the hacker just puts his own account every time you put a transaction through the, through the app. So, Sometimes we advise to just show a list of account statements, but don't let them do um, an actual transaction. So you can still use the app, but the transaction fails on a rooted device. Should it run on an emulator is a question you can ask, because an emulator is rooted by default. <coughs> can, should you detect dynamic code injection? As I said, hooking allows you to instrument code to basically pass arguments, to change arguments before they pass through a method. And you can detect application tampering. For example, look at the certificate that's being used to sign the application, because you know your own certificate, and if it's not leaked, then there's no way that an attacker can use your certificate to sign the application. So if the certificate is changed, then you know that your application has been re-signed by someone and you shouldn't trust it. And lastly, um, it's very difficult to protect against memory dump attacks. It's really hard to perform those attacks, but security researchers or really good hackers can do this. So what you want to do is here, you want to minimize the attack window. And wha what I mean by that is you can minimize the amount of time that sec secret keys are in memory or when your code is in memory. For example, by not using string objects, but using a char array and just zero out the array when you're not using it anymore. Now, how can, you how can you scan your environment? Um, for example, the safety net API basically it lets you get Google's opinion on the device status, and it's part of the Google Play Services SDK. Um, it's implemented as a remote at attestation, which basically means, okay, Google, uh, you say to Google, this is the device I want to run on, check it for me. Is it compatible? Is, it, is there something fishy going on here? And what you get back is a JSON web signature. And as a developer, you need to review the response and verify the signature because this is, a, this is signed by the Google key and you can use the Google Play services to verify this. 
um, JSON web signature, but you have to do this actively. You can't um, just get the response and just say, okay, I got a response. So because it can be man in the middle, it can be changed somewhere on the way. The method call is safety net API dot at test. And it looks at various device attributes, like the installed packages. If, are there super user files uh, on the device? Are there settings? Um, for example, ADB enabled. Is there a lock screen enabled? Um, the security enhanced Linux state, um, which is a, a kernel uh, security feature. Um, are there uh, applications running a, as a device administrator which are blacklisted? For example, there are malwares that try to run as a device administrator and safety net can detect this and much more. In the references, there is a URL that you can check which has a great uh, write-up of um, someone who reverse engineered the safety net API and just and, and saw what, 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 was, uh, what they actually check uh, against. But these were the most interesting for me. So. Oops. All right. Let's go through that. So what are the advantages? Google knows a lot. So we all know Google knows a lot. Your device is always online. If you have the Play Store or the Google Play Store on there, then Google knows everything about your device. So it gives you an extensive device review. Disadvantage, you only get a binary answer. So it's a compatibility test. So Google says, OK, this is compatible on a standard Android device. Um, this application can run on a standard Android device. Um, and this device is along the guidelines what we think an Android runtime should look like on Android device. You have a Google Play services dependency, which is a disadvantage, disadvantage if you don't have it already. You need to actively verify the JSON web signature. You need an internet connection, but apps mostly, uh, all, most apps these days already need that. So, so conclusion, we, we, what, what I want to point out in this presentation is that you can reduce your attack surfaces by in implementing strong coding practices and, storing, and strong uh, cryptography. Protect code statically to various la layers that protect code and each other. Harden the communications and scan, detect, and protect against insecure execution environments. Are there any questions? Yes? Are these slides going to be available along with, along with the video? Um, I think so, yeah. I have a quick question about your ping your certificate. When you ping that, does that mean I only trust that one specific certificate? It depends on which public key that you define. So if you define a public key of an intermediate certificate, then it's, you, can all, you can implement it like I, I, um, I check if the certificate that I get um, is, can, can be chained back to one that I pin on. And if you pin on an intermediate certificate, then you can pin on everything below that intermediate certificate. So I can pick whether it's just that specific for all, everything, including the one that you write from the other one. Exactly, yeah. So it's an option. Um, yeah, you ha just have to provide all the public key uh, hashes that you want to pin on. OK. Yeah. I have a couple of questions. One is, uh, what's the difference between ProGuard and DexGuard in the sense that if one is DexGuard a replacement for, for ProGuard, or you use them both at the same time? Well, um, DexGuard um, does everything that ProGuard does, but it does it more aggressive, so it can do a better job because ProGuard only looks at Java bytecode. It doesn't look at resources, assets, or anything else. So DexGuard does a whole package that looks at everything. And um, all the security features like string encryption, clause encryption are not in ProGuard. Um, so DexGuard has all these static protection things like code encryption and stuff. And it also has a really big dynamic part where we offer you tools to do root detection, to perform emulator detection. And then how you act on it is your call. The other one is you mentioned a couple of libraries from the Guardian project. Yeah. Cypher, NetCypher. Yeah. Uh, something that I read recently also from the Guardian project is this new Android OS called Copperhead Android. I don't know if yeah. you care about it. Copperhead OS. Be yeah. Like a secure version of Android for Nexus devices. I yeah. I'm just curious if you knew about it and what was your opinion about it. Yeah. Um, I like the project Copperhead OS. I would run it on uh, if uh, I have a Nexus device, so I run Copperhead OS. Um, and it's cool because they have um, a really good security <laughs> team on it, and they, um, they deliver patches really quick. So for example, on Android, the Android space layered randomization, I don't know if that sounds some, says something, but it's basically um, a security feature to protect against memory exploits, like for example, buffer overflows or something. It was well known that it was somewhat broken on Android devices until I think 6.0 or 5.0, I don't know exactly. 
But Copo had OS um, upstream this to their um, project, and you, if you install it, then you have all these security features, um, which I like the most because it takes a long time to security patches to reach you. Al although they now have these security patches over the air implemented, which is a, a good effort there. So um, yeah, but Copo had OS. I, I really like the project. Uh, yeah, last question I think. Or yeah. So uh, what, what's your question? Uh, if, if you have. So yeah. 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 I don't get your question. Um, so, so what's the problem with Tor? <laughs> Yeah. For people to blind my IP, and yeah. they can switch my IP address dynamically to Prox, it's available across Russia or everywhere. Now, if you include Tor right in the app yeah. through DexGuard, yeah, DexGuard doesn't. Even happier to actually exploit that directly. Yeah, DexGuard doesn't offer you to implement uh, Tor, so it's a security library. Um, um, well, you can use Tor, for example, to basically, um, if, if you have an application that gets a Twitter feed of something and you inclu include Tor, that protects your user against the server that you're getting the Twitter feed from. So that would be a use case. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Um, there are like other use cases that you actually see in the hacker specific. Yeah. Maybe we can talk afterwards uh, a little bit more. Okay. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you.